Digital Foundry is proudly sponsored by MSI's new range of next generation QD OLED gaming monitors, available in two sizes, 32 inch 4K 240 Hz and 27 inch 1440p 360 Hz. These are some of the best monitors we've ever tested with incredible motion clarity, 1000 nit HDR highlights, OLED burning protection, AI features and genuinely game-changing performance. Check the video description below to learn more and for UK viewers, enter to win an MSI MPG 271QRX 360Hz QD OLED. Well, hello there and welcome to a brand new DF Direct special. Uh, the technical specifications for the PlayStation 5 Pro uh, appear to have been published last week to developers. Uh, leaks swiftly followed, a bunch of them have now sort of swept the internet and we can confirm that pretty much they're all true at this point as we have also seen that same documentation. Uh, plenty to discuss here and joining me to uh, talk through it, first of all, Oliver McKenzie. Hi. Yes, really excited to be here to chat about the upcoming Trinity console or PlayStation 5 Pro as it might otherwise be known but yeah it should mm -hmm. be a should be an interesting chat and uh, I guess we're following up on this from prior discussions right Alex Patalia yeah that's true uh, but I would be remiss if I didn't take John's words from him and I said PlayStation 5 professional so now that that's out in the open we can not say it for the rest of the episode there is still the inference that the standard model is now in some way amateur <laughs> yes <laughs> but, but let's just uh, move on to our first topic. Okay, so the first topic we want to talk about is, well, essentially, um, yes, if we go back to the PlayStation 4 Pro, the main issue with it in terms of being a meaningful upgrade across the board was its uh, CPU, right? It was basically the same CPU that was uh, within the base PlayStation 4, though it did have a clock speed enhancement. Now, this basically limited what the machine was capable of in terms of high frame rate gameplay. And obviously, there wouldn't be any game changing uh, enhancements that involved physics, for example. Now, we're looking at the specifications for the PlayStation 5 Pro, and it looks much the same playbook, actually. Um, the CPU is the same Zen 2 cluster that we saw in the PlayStation 5. And it actually has two modes. We can confirm this. Um, basically, there's a standard mode where the CPU clocks to a maximum of 3.5 gigahertz. And then there's an enhanced mode. This enhanced mode essentially adds 10% to uh, core frequency, giving us a maximum of 3.85 gigahertz. And um, because the new PlayStation 5 Pro, similar to the standard PlayStation 5, seems to operate with a fixed power cap, this means that there is some degradation to GPU performance. They're looking at a impact of 1.5% to clocks and 1% to GPU performance generally, um, which, you know, basically is, I'd describe that as an irrelevance really. Um, Alex, I'm going to come to you first of all about this. What do you think of this um, decision? I mean, there are reasons why, but it is a bit of a disappointment because, you know, what we've found recently is that the CPU limitations on the current gen consoles are very much real, right? For sure. And I think we're going to be seeing more and more games coming out in the near to midterm future uh, where we can see uh, essentially that uh, the current gen consoles, yes, uh, they were much more powerful in relative CPU terms at the time of their release to PC components. Uh, for example, the Jaguar cores in the Xbox One and PlayStation 4 weren't at all good actually at release while there was a level of competence here uh, by using Z versions of Zen 2, uh, Ryzen yeah. Zen 2, uh, that we're seeing the limitations coming in. And it's mainly has to do um, with kind of like single core speed of the CPUs versus what is out there right now in the PC space. And that uh, means for certain things, just primarily 30 FPS experiences on the consoles. And there's there's examples of that coming out in the future. Uh, we also have historical examples, like some of them are not great examples, uh, like for example, Gotham Knights, where uh, we know that the game is just a problem because it runs poorly <laughs> everywhere, but it still had the limitations of being a 30 FPS cap due to the way it was programmed and what they wanted for a consistent experience. And I feel um, at least from the perspective of their side, it probably makes sense to keep things as is because there's certain things that developers rely upon 
uh, to scale their games and changing the CPU architecture to something more modern uh, might complicate the development environment where they have to take into account certain other things. For example, the amount of cores or adding in things like a 3D vCache uh, that you see in the later Ryzen processors. Uh, you wouldn't really expect those things. Um, so I think maybe for just keeping development consistent and non-complicated as is, keeping the CPU the exact same is very reasonable. Um, whether or not consumers are um, appreciative of that is an entirely different question. Um, but yeah, I, I see it as kind of reasonable from that aspect. Also, potentially, one thing that is very interesting that you talked about just now, Richard, is that there is a very different consideration in the console space for essentially how much wattage is going through the machine. And Sony went yeah. through a very went through a different design this time versus what Xbox has done. And they kind of automatically manage the power level via clocks the entire time the thing is on. And uh, that leads to other repercussions in terms of clock speed, as well as in terms of like the balance between GPU and CPU at all in one moment. So I think probably Zen 2, as it is, played another role in that as to why it is the way it is, probably. Mm -hmm. uh, anything extra to add to that, Oliver? Well, I don't know. I kind of frame it <laughs> in, in certain terms. Um, when you look at the PS4 Pro, it had a 31% clock advantage over the PS4. You were going from 1.6 gigahertz to 2.1 gigahertz, which was a pretty substantial yeah. clock increase and actually like... I remember back in the day, like playing Battlefield 1 around the PS4 Pro's launch, and that actually running a lot better on the PS4 Pro than the PS4. And that's not because of any GPU advantage. Obviously, the increase there was was pretty, you know, insubstantial relative to the CPU increase in that particular title when you're playing 64 player matches. Here, we're looking at about a 10% increase in that uh, optional 3.85 gigahertz mode, which is not that compelling, especially in light of, and I'm sure Alex will talk about this a lot, in light of ray tracing, where ray tracing can be really intensive on the CPU. And that poses like really big issues potentially for games that are trying to push additional ray tracing features on the PlayStation 5 Pro or Trinity hardware. Um, and that's potentially a really big problem. And of course, I understand that it has to be, you know, there are probably a lot of really good reasons as to why it should continue to be Zen 2. But personally, and maybe this ties into the process node discussion a bit, but, but personally, I was expecting a higher clocked uh, CPU, and that does not seem to have materialized, or at least seems to have materialized in a very limited fashion relative to expectations. Yeah, yeah, that's an interesting point because the, um, well, first of all, let's talk about Zen 2 and why they're sticking with it. I think it's basically an area thing. Zen 2 is, offers great performance for the amount of area on the silicon chip that it occupies. And, um, you know, Zen 3, Zen 4, as you know, basically as you move through the Zens, you're getting <laughs> uh, higher area usage that isn't proportionately in line with the performance increase, I think. Um, and yes, so basically it kind of makes sense also for compatibility reasons to stay on um, Zen 2. Just makes things a lot easier uh, from a production and developer perspective. Um, the clock speed increase, it's not great. I mean, when we saw with, I mean, it wasn't just PS4 Pro, it was also Xbox One X that also had a 31% um, uh, bump to frequencies. The, the thing they had in common was that they moved to 16 nanometer from 28 nanometer. Now, this all strongly suggests one of two scenarios uh, owing to this limited clock boost. Number one, um, they do have a set limit of power that can be consumed by both CPU and GPU, and moving that clock up too high will take up too much of that power budget and it will take up to it will take away too much from the GPU. I think the good thing about this enhanced mode, it might only be 10%, but if it is only you know a 1% impact on GPU performance, that's basically unnoticeable. Whereas 10% extra CPU time uh, would be, you know, quite good, I think. Mm -hmm. in games that are CPU limited. That said, we can't talk about specific titles at this time, but there are titles out there coming soon that are in the twenties owing to be owing to being CPU limited. I guess what we can talk about is Baldur's Gate three, right? Right. That's a very good one, right. actually. Yeah. yeah. That ten percent extra GPU performance isn't gonna do much at all. If you're like, you know, 
25 frames per second it'll be at like 27 28 <laughs> frames per second it's still not great if you see what i mean yeah um yeah so it, you know it could be the wattage thing as well that's 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 holding that back but also it could be the process node right um the playstation 5 started on seven nanometer it's moved down to six nanometer the dial went from about 320 millimeter square to about 280 ish um I do think that we're probably on six nanometers for this because I do think you probably have more leeway for moving clocks higher um, if they are on a proper, you know, a properly better process node. This, you know, all of the, the data that we've suggest here does kind of suggest we're still on six nanometer. And that's actually quite interesting um, because I do think that that would be viable for the specification that they're leaking here, that has been leaked here rather. And also that um, the GPU clock also seems to be quite um, conservative, shall we say, that also points towards a wattage limit and um, uh, a process node being more of a conservative improvement than we saw with PlayStation 4 Pro. The upshot of this is, as Alex said, is that the games that are targeting 30 FPS are not right now are not going to be targeting 60 frames per second on PlayStation 5 Pro if they're CPU limited. So, you know, all of the sort of conjectures that, hey, this is going to be a great uh, box for Grand Theft Auto 6. Uh, we'll be able to run that at 60 frames per second unless there's some magical CPU stuff being done by Rockstar. I suggest that's not going to happen. Extra 10% on clocks isn't really going to do much at all. It will help your sort of worst possible frame rates when you're CPU limited, but it's not a game changer. I think that's that's pretty clear. Right. Uh, any, anything to add to that, Alex? Uh, no. I mean, uh, I, the only thing I would say is that like uh, we should always want developers to target the best possible experience on every machine. And right. um, just because there's been a handful of games right now that are uh, not doing a great 30 or dropping because of CPU limit issues doesn't mean all games are going to be that way. So there is potential, obviously, for games to be brought up to 60 FPS when they're 30 on PlayStation 5 base. Amateur. Uh, <laughs> but it just it means that the CPU cannot be the hindering factor for the reason why that game is at 30 FPS. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And in actual fact, you know, when you look at the GPU and the machine upscaling stuff that we're machine learning based upscales, upscaling stuff that we'll talk about later, one might also say that we've got a very PS4 Pro Xbox One X style scenario in that the GPU is far more powerful than the CPU. It's not a particularly balanced system. Um, so developers are going to have to cater for that. Uh, actually, one thing I was just thinking about in terms of this um, Zen 3 architecture boost um oliver rog ally uses uh, zen 3 right yes we're not seeing game changingly better cpu performance versus the steam deck re really are we no it's i mean the probably most of the improvement comes from the clock bump in certain cpu limited games because you can get the the rog ally can go to like 4.4 gigahertz notionally and, if and it has more cores it has, it has twice as many cores well. yeah <laughs> so uh, that does do something for you. I think the IPC uplift from uh, Zen 3 is it's not that huge. It's like, to what, 10, 15%, something in that, in that range. Yeah. So it's, for, for, yeah, this is not, this is not a, it's not a travesty, he's... but I would have expected, again, a bigger <laughs> uplift, hopefully. I think the other thing, of course, is that if you do have that um, power limit, then, you know, the chances of getting more out of a more enhanced architecture, it's kind of like diminishing returns, really. Yeah. So I think that's probably why they've gone for this particular setup. Yeah, And it is, I mean, the more I look at this, it, the more it does remind me in terms of overall design objectives as the 4 Pro, you know, it's basically the same machine, but with a much better GPU. And um, there's some other nice things that we'll talk mm -hmm. about. Um, but yeah, CPU, I think we'll get that one out of the way because, um, first of all, because I do think it is probably the thing that's probably going to disappoint people most, um, especially as, you know, as the generation has progressed. We didn't quite expect to see ourselves being CPU limited in as many titles as we have been, but we are. And the 5 Pro is only going to make a marginal difference to that. So, yeah. <laughs> One last thing I have to say, and I was just thinking about it right now, is that there's a technical upgrade that um, later Zen has that 
didn't make it back for this and probably was unrealistic for it to be. But I, I look at my 7800X3D and that's all one CCX. It is not right. splitting the cores up into uh, with the infinity fabric in between the, the four four, essentially two units of four, which uh, slows down things. Uh, in general, it's been kind of like the biggest issue with rising performance for gaming over time. So that's why people, when they buy gaming uh, Ryzen PCs, they do actually look, uh, it's why people recommend actually the eight core variants or the six core variants that don't have the cross, you know, CCX thing going on there with the infinity fabric. So uh, that was one thing that could technically have been brought in and maybe die space is an entirely different question, but also bringing up the, the cash amounts to what desktop Zen is. Um, I can't, I actually don't know how much that affects wattage of the system, but um, bringing that up could have been another semi invisible way to improve performance. But once again, that's die space and on a console, that's a lot of money. So. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I guess we should move on to the next part of the uh, disclosures that we've seen so far. And that concerns the GPU. Now, we should expect to see some significant advances here because we're moving from 36 compute units to 60, um, which is, you know, obviously a pretty big <laughs> improvement in terms of raw compute power. We're also seeing uh, big improvements to memory bandwidth, circa 25%, which I think is excellent. Um, there's also, well, when you look at the teraflop numbers, we need to talk about teraflops really because this is a bit of a bone of contention because obviously the PlayStation 5 um, had about 10.23 teraflops, I believe, uh, based on the RDNA2 architecture. Now, Sony is actually disclosing here that there's 33.5 teraflops um, with PlayStation 5 Pro, which, you know, looks amazing, right? It looks like a threefold increase. However, uh, that's not really the way you can't really expect three times performance and actually sony is saying that we should expect more like 45 percent of extra performance if you just use existing games i guess alex do you want to talk about dual issue fp32 because it seems to distort teraflops somewhat significantly yeah we saw this in the pc space between rdna2 and rdna3 as well as between turing and ampere so Ampere did something interesting where it did con concurrent int operations as well. And that was an interesting, uh, I don't know, evolution that they, they immediately backtracked on uh, with <laughs> Ampere. Uh, I don't know why, but they did. Uh, and they brought out this dual issue F FP32 architecture, which uh, in practice highly inflated, like what we're seeing here, the theoretical teraflops performance of the GPU versus its peers in like the same class from different architectures, um, earlier architectures. But in terms of gameplay performance, it really did not actually, um, I would say move the needle in a way that was like doubling of some very large portion of the overall frame time of an entire game. Because obviously this does have an effect. But um, there are other, so technically things can run two times as fast, but an entire frame is made up of so many different processes, which are waiting on one another and scheduling, and they're reliant on things like how much cache is there? Is the cache full? Is the cache been cleared? Uh, how much bandwidth is there in this very one moment? Are we moving things from here to there? There's a lot of other things in a GPU other than it's just raw compute performance that um, say actually whether or not it'll perform X amount better than some competing architecture doing some certain task. It's a bit wishy-washy way to say that this actually, the, you shouldn't really look at the teraflop number here because we've seen this exact same thing coming, happening in the PC space over two different architectures. And it led to uh, strange results of scaling where you look at things, I think it's like the 6700 and like the 7700 if I'm not yeah. mistaken, on the RDNA 2 to RDNA 3 side. And they have like wildly different teraflops numbers. But if you look at their performance, you would never think that uh, in titles, like being benchmarked across titles. So um, this is just a nice little bonus that will make certain aspects of the GPU faster. But in terms of the overall frame time, um, there's other aspects to be considered. 
Yeah, I guess we can also look at ROG Ally as an example yet again, yeah. because it too has dual <laughs> issue FP32. And it's like an 8 terabyte it's, yeah, machine. So, yeah. <laughs> it's like, in, on paper, it's supposed to be like twice as fast as a PS4 Pro, if you if you were to believe yeah. those numbers, but obviously... Or an Xbox Series S. Yeah, for that yeah, matter. <laughs> that's not realized in practice in the slightest. So. <laughs> uh, anything to add to that, Oliver, about you know this whole situation with the GPU? I mean, you've... Mm. Plus forty five percent of performance uplift from going from uh, uh, thirty six compute units to sixty isn't fantastic, really, but it is kind of believable. It is very plausible. I think that basically you have sixty CUs relative to thirty six. Yeah. I think that's sixty seven percent more CUs. We don't know the clock speed. I don't think. Um, and on the balance side, you get a 28% uplift, I believe, with moving from 14 giga, giga transfers per second memory to 18. And then when you look at the PS4 Pro, you know, that had, I, I looked up the figures, it had 24% faster memory and then um, about, I think, about 2.3 times faster uh, on the flop number. So, like on paper, this seems less impressive. But if you dive into the other aspects of the spec sheet, it actually does seem like this is uh, more impressive than it initially seems. That 45% figure that's being provided to developers is maybe not indicative of the true power of the system when you think about it holistically. But if you're just yeah. running the same workloads, it's it's uh, it's a pretty meager uplift for a pro console, I would say. Right. Yeah, I mean, people have reversed engineered the teraflops to give us a clock speed number, and that right. clock speed number is 2.18 gigahertz, which is actually slower than PlayStation 5's 2.23. Now, obviously, the boost clock situation and the wattage limit may play a, a part in how much clock speed you're actually getting out of the 5 uh, versus the 5 Pro. Um, but yeah, that's certainly interesting. Um, what else can we say about the GPU? I mean, it's it's obviously a much bigger chip. Um, it's, it's weird that it's running at a slightly lower clock. I'm wondering yeah. if there's going to be compatibility reasons, uh, sorry, compatibility issues, or whether it just clocks up back to where it should do and just deactivates CUs uh, <sighs> when it's in PlayStation 5 back compat mode. That's going to be quite interesting to see. And from there, of course, you know, just basically what's going to happen with backwards compatibility in general. Will it run just like a PlayStation 5? Or will there be some kind of optional boost mode similar to the to the 4 Pro there? One thing that I actually think is kind of interesting about the potential of it being a much wider GPU with potentially a lower clock speed than the original PlayStation 5 is that it actually, if you go back to uh, Mark Cerny's original presentation on the PlayStation 5, uh, it is almost counterintuitive to the philosophy of that he put forward for the PlayStation 5 GPU of it being narrow and highly clocked. Um, uh, in this case, it would be very wide, but like mediocrely clocked. It's wider, <laughs> you know, like I think relative to the Xbox Series X, it's like right around there. Um, and I think this could be precip it could be two reasons for this. One is this the obvious one in the room. It's the wattage thing again. Like it's just butting in the way and it limits essentially what they can do. Um, but also the fact that uh, mid-gen games are very different than early gen games because there's the transition over to using more compute and less, I would say, just older techniques uh, that defined cross-gen games, which were essentially higher resolution of the old stuff. Um, and I think as developers move towards more cross-gen titles that are using more things like GI, ray tracing, interesting simulations that require a lot of compute, the Xboxes, or even mesh shaders, the Xboxes architecture has proven itself in the last couple of titles, I think at least that Oliver's looked at, uh, to being a pretty great performer vis-a-vis -vis the PlayStation 5. And maybe this, um, the PlayStation 5 Pro, is also like the Series X geared towards a later gen, um, I don't know, different workload that the GPU has to contend with. Yeah, I also just think like they're really butting up against whatever power constraints are supposed to be evident for consoles. Because like when you look at comparable AMD GPUs, they are in the region of about 250 watts, like an RX 6700 or 6800 rather, or um, a 7700 XT. So I think, I think there is a good chance, I mean, almost an overwhelming chance, especially if this is on six nanometers, that this is the most power hungry console ever made 
more wattage than a launch <laughs> PS4 or PS3 rather. Oh my so, goodness, yeah. Yeah, I think I think this thing might be a bit of a chonker in the region of <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if it's in the region of 300 watts is a number I would think of, uh, maybe a little short oh, of I that, love but it. but certainly probably in contention for that given the mooted specs here. So I think it would be a bit of a console that's unlike consoles as we know them currently, at least in terms of its thermal configuration. Yeah, that, that's an interesting point. Again, 4 Pro went from uh, 28 nanometer on the base machine to 16 nanometer on the Pro machine. And then as a bonus, you got a slim machine that you know was, was really efficient and quiet. Yeah. Um, now the issue is that it really does look as though we're on a similar process load. And we've already seen the slim console. And, and there it is back there. It's not actually that much slimmer and it looks as though the power uh, reduction is in the region of 10 to 20 percent based on uh, some tests that i've seen comparing uh, the five sorry the six nanometer chip to the uh, launch seven nanometer so yes it does kind of suggest that it is going to be consuming a lot more power uh, in order to service those 60 compute units uh, so yeah i am going to be interested to see the form factor <laughs> it's going to be fascinating to see that. That said, I think, you know, over the generations, you know, because there's been like four different uh, PlayStation 5s at this point, they have successfully reduced the size of the heatsink each time, even before they did the process shrink. So maybe a machine that's more in line with the size of the original PlayStation 5, possibly slightly larger. That's likely the way forward, possibly. Just have to see this thing, really. Um, I think overall, though, I mean, uh, what's happening here is that Sony has kind of um, uh, done the best they could with the existing cost-efficient sort of process uh, that's available to them, which is seemingly uh, six nanometer. If it's five nanometer, then things, you know, become even more interesting at that point, which is like, why are we getting these limited clocks? It should be doing a lot better than that. Um, so yeah, interesting stuff. But the other thing, of course, is that um, 4 Pro is essentially like a um, the GPU is essentially a butterfly image of the original GPU. It yeah. basically doubled the amount of compute units. We're not doubling the CUs at this point, and that's likely because we don't have that meaningful process shrink. And on top of that, um, you know, the cost per transistor is such that you know it would be a very machine, a very expensive machine to produce if they did do that. So, yeah, that's probably why we're seeing a more, how can I say it, NVIDIA-like approach, which is to say that, hey, we can't just throw transistors at the problem anymore to get more performance. We actually need to have uh, better solutions here. And part of that is going to be software, which we'll talk about shortly in terms of the machine right. learning side. Um, but let's move on and talk about the next discussion point here. And that is uh, ray tracing. Now, this is really interesting because um, there's been quite a lot of excitement. You know, it's been described as a ray tracing beast. Uh, uh, the actual Sony disclosures to developers are talking about a two to three times increase in ray tracing performance, sometimes even uh, four times increase. There's also been conjecture that we're looking at uh, maybe a preview of RDNA 4 uh, RT architecture here, which again would be quite exciting. Now, this does need to be couched with a certain degree of caution based on the way that Sony is describing the extra RT power. They're talking about games potentially having ray tracing where they don't on the standard PlayStation 5. And they're also talking about, hey, well, if a game has RT uh, reflections on the base PlayStation 5, you could possibly add RT shadows as well. Now, that's obviously great, right? But that seems to be sort of tempering the expectation level somewhat. Um, this two to four times RT performance, I'd be really interested in your take on this, Alex. I'm just wondering how much of that actually comes from the fact that you have 60 compute units right. versus 36. That would be, in terms of RDNA terms, it would be a good way to double the amount of performance uh, in general, because you would essentially have two times the amount of ray triangle or ray bounding box intersections by virtues of more CUs, uh, then you would also have, because RDNA 2 and RDNA 3, other than that, do everything in software regarding ray tracing. 
So all the traversal, all the denoising, anything uh, is done in software there. And if you had double the CUs for the compute there, you would be getting double the performance regarding those tasks, presuming there's not some other confounding factor making them less or more uh, performant. So I think the 2x thing is very reasonable at the exact same settings. The uh, It was when you get into three or four, uh, that I wonder what is going on exactly and what that is exactly describing. Um, because for example, if you had, we don't know what this is doing hardware wise. And I think Oliver would like to talk about that too, because he's looked at uh, Mac stuff before where they have uh, ray tracing uh, acceleration. And we don't, we just don't know at this moment in time, based upon this lex, uh, le leak of specs, what exactly this version of RDNA is doing to accelerate ray tracing. If it is taking the RDNA 3 and what it kind of looks like RDNA 4 approach is doing is where it's kind of adding more instructions, but not adding like specific hardware, which, which takes over certain aspects of the ray tracing pipeline. There's like a philosophy difference there between AMD and what in Intel and Nvidia do, where it's not like the more core eras of AMD, but like if you add more cores, you get more performance. And Nvidia and Intel, on the other hand, say, well, there's certain aspects where if you make dedicated hardware for them, you can, you know, save a lot of power and perhaps die space and frame time by just adding a little bit more stuff on the die there and then taking over a task and hyper accelerating it. So, um, NVIDIA, for example, has like a traversal unit. So it is Intel to take care of the traversal aspect of, uh, of uh, sending an array through a BV8 structure. Whether or not that's here in the PlayStation 5 Pro, I cannot tell you. Um, but that th potential three or four number could be referencing the fact that whatever version of the architecture they're using here for RDNA um, does speed up inordinately in comparison to the other steps of RT, it speeds it up a bit. So maybe there is more ray tracing bounding box intersections that can be done per second per CU than previous architectures or something like that. And that would let, speed up one aspect of the ray tracing pipeline more, but the overall frame time of a game wouldn't be three times or four times more, but one aspect of the frame might be three times faster than the previous thing. Yeah, I think that's an important dis <laughs> distinction here. You know, Marvel Spider-Man has excellent ray tracing for a console game, right? But, you know, it's not going to be running at, the you know, performance mode isn't going to be hitting like 120 frames per second just because the pro right. can do twice the, <laughs> the RT calculation speed. That's just not the way it works, really. Right. It's just one part of the, you know, the frame that's being uh, calculated there. Uh, Oliver, thoughts? Yeah, it's an interesting point. And when you look at AMD, they are kind of the odd man out here because as far as I'm aware, uh, Intel, NVIDIA, and Apple have all gone with this very like hardware-centric, dedicated hardware-centric approach to tackling ray tracing. And if I look through the, the document here, the language I think is suggesting, although this is just spitballing, that it's probably using AMD IP because they're not talking about using a custom solution. So I'd have to again just kind of like spitballing or thinking this through i think the more likely thing is that they probably are accelerating individual parts of the ray tracing pipeline they're probably still using the shaders in a similar manner as as is the priority in architectures if this is a uh, doing something new then that would be probably the, the case i would think and um yeah I, I but but i guess the other aspect of it would be th this document is pretty trying to be pretty informative to developers so when you look at certain figures like the 45% uplift in general rendering capability in the same workload, that is not a flattering figure. <laughs> and some of these yeah. figures are not super flattering. So maybe this is a case where, hey, Sony is trying to actually tell the developers something practical about the performance of the machine. Um, in which case you'd say, hey, maybe that is actually a more instructive figure in terms of the general capability of the machine and not just speeding up traversal or something. Right. Yeah, I mean, it, it does seem that we're looking at a more... Uh, advanced form of RDNA th uh, architecture here for sure. I mean, um, the developer documentation also references that um, variable rate shading has been added, which, you know, 
basically would have been there since <laughs> RDNA 2. Sony decided not to implement it in um, PlayStation 5, but it just gets added naturally in PlayStation 5 Pro. So that's something that we could confirm there. But yeah, I mean, it's quite interesting to see that generally in terms of the um, overall design target for PlayStation 5 Pro, Sony itself isn't really promising anything more than much higher effective resolutions. And we'll talk about that at the moment, plus enhanced ray tracing. Uh, so it's interesting how they're going to approach this from a marketing perspective because obviously when PlayStation 4 Pro came along they had like a dual pronged approach here it was like the arrival of 4k screens and we wanted to produce a console that addressed those screens and they also um, added in full HDR support at the same time whereas this it's basically talking almost like it's a machine for digital foundry fans almost you know higher mm. performance better resolution almost um, yeah, really interesting stuff, but um, I'm just wondering how they're going to sell this. Well, that, that that is interesting because like when you look at the PS4 Pro, that was really a machine that was marketed at 4K displays and it did a pretty effective job of that. Whereas here, like you're talking about increased resolution, improved frame rate, which is like, okay, questionable <laughs> based on what we've discussed <laughs> so far. And then adding ray tracing and adding graphical features. So I think that the problem here is that they have a machine that sort of is like a bit of a PC style box where they're saying, hey, developers, you know, pick your pick your poison in terms of these upgrades that you could potentially do with this increased hardware power, which was, of course, was the case with PS4 Pro. But they had a very explicit target in mind with that machine. And the developers had a very specific imperative to go forward with that machine. Whereas here, you know, theoretically, you could see all kinds of different approaches. And that doesn't I don't know how you market that to people quite. Mm, right, yeah. definitely. I guess we're going to find out soon enough. <laughs> um, let's move on to the next discussion point okay so um, Sony has machine learning uh, silicon within the PlayStation 5 Pro that's now been confirmed now what's also interesting is that the developer disclosures specifically describe it as cu a custom solution which suggests that it's something bespoke to Sony and um, they've got um, their own version of what sounds like DLSS called PSSR which is, what is that, PlayStation Spectral Super Resolution? Is that right? Yeah. Um, Alex, do you want to talk about that? Sure. Um, okay, so uh, where do I want to start here? I guess with the acronym itself, um, the spectral aspect of it, um, I, we really don't know what that is completely referring to. But I would just take a guess at it that is looking at uh, not just like the pure red, green, blue color image of of what whatever is being done with uh, a game's rendering and then the motion vectors, but it's looking at some aspect spectrally, so some some other way animals tend to see the world i don't know uh <laughs> it's going to be playing with i, I presume leveraging this that the fact that your perception is different for certain aspects of an image and then applying machine learning based upon those principles to get a better looking reconstruction at the end as to how it's done in detail i will have no idea until they detail it um Sounds fair enough. yeah but the one really interesting aspect of this is i think the documentation makes direct reference to the fact that 1080p to 4k is uh, referenced, I believe, directly in the documentation. And that is very good. And it flies directly uh, kind of in the face of uh, AMD's ongoing efforts with FSR2, interestingly enough, where FSR2 was made as a competitor solution in the PC space to DLSS. And I found, and I think a lot of people have talked about it, who know about it, saying the really interesting aspect of DLSS is that it can take images that are one fourth the amount of pixels and blow them up to four times the amount of pixels and still look really good. I mean, yeah. not perfect, but still really good. And that's one area that checkerboard rendering couldn't do. That is one area that FSR cannot do, FSR 2. Uh, whenever you look at the comparison of a game running an FSR 2 performance mode versus XESS performance mode using the XMX cores on an Intel Arc chip or using one using DLSS on an RTX card, it really blows them out of the water, the DLSS and XESS implementations. They're really great. Um, so this is great. Uh, and I think it offsets everything else here 
in the document as being the most interesting thing here and the one for the most potential and the one that thing that is actually going to offer perhaps the largest tangible benefit for anyone using this machine is that it's going to offer we have to see it in person of course but it's going to presumably offer really good anti-aliasing great temporal stability and since it's machine learning it's going to be avoiding a lot of the pitfalls that we see in fsr2 uh and this generation as it's been going on has been rife with this now the fsr2 has gained popularity on the consoles or not there's games that still don't use it but if there's an open if there's a library here then that they're going to provide from sony and it seems like they are based upon the documentation to just naturally plug it into a game engine with the same inputs as fsr2 and dlss it's going to lead to really great image quality in games based upon xcss and dlss so rejoice this is this is really good yeah i mean they are talking about um a, a huge increase in effective resolution right which is what it's all about and i've been thinking about this and um yeah we have, we're seeing a lot of instances now where base resolutions on playstation 5 games are basically too low and then they're using fsr2 to upscale to 1440p or 4k and it just kind of looks a bit grim so on the one hand we've got additional gpu re resources to increase the base resolution and then we have pssr to take it up to 4k or even 1440p as uh, may well happen on the more demanding games and or 1800p as we saw with cyberpunk um so yeah there's there's definitely um a, what i would describe as a game-changing improvement to image quality potentially here if pssr is on a par with XCSS on an, Intel, on an Intel GPU or NVIDIA's DLSS. I'm curious what you think about this, Oliver. Yeah, I, I think that FSR2 is not so good in a lot of games. <laughs> like it, it does. It, it yeah. can look good, but there are certain scenarios where yeah. it just isn't really a good fit. And if you've got like very fast moving content, it, it can tend to fall apart at low resolutions, I think. Yeah. It, it does depend a lot on the content and the way the camera works and how detailed the yeah. artwork is and how like are they using lots of screen space reflections and stuff like that like in uh in in the recent um oh gosh uh, with skull bones that was that was tough for me but uh, yeah that, that was also for me too yeah right. basically <laughs> basically you know things that make upscaling easier make up sampling easier tend to favor fsr2 so that's not a not a huge surprise given how it tends to function but here we're interestingly talking about increases in resolution increases in image quality that might come independent of actual increases in compute which theoretically frees up gp resources to do other more interesting things which i think is that's actually a really good thing because when you look at consoles you know a 1440p image on a console can look really good in a 4k display whereas i would say for a pc monitor maybe that's not quite as true so if they can actually open up resources to use this thing more like a pc give you some flexibility on the rendering side of things then i think that could be very compelling presuming this cpu doesn't pose an issue Mm -hmm. uh, Alex, there's been a mooted two millisecond cost for PSSR. Yeah. What does that actually mean? Uh, I mean, in the in the grand scheme of things, it means nothing because it's contextless. <laughs> but in the in the context of what developers have to be used to, uh, for example, FSR two from our interviews with AMD costs around two milliseconds on an Xbox Series X going up to four. Okay, so this is what they're trying to say with that is it costs roughly the amount of same amount of frame time as FSR 2. Okay. Uh, so, um, and you're getting way better quality, like ridiculously better quality in a lot of instances. So this is great. And they, they point to the fact that it'll be optimized further. Uh, I point this to that the, at the fact that DLS over DLSS 2 over time up into its current 3 X iteration has been optimized, took advantage of sparsity, which was added to Ampere and Lovelace GPUs after the fact. Um, they also changed the model over time to be just better, uh, more efficient for the same cost in terms of millisecond frame time. So like nowadays on like a 4090 DLSS costs like less than 0 0.5 milliseconds. It's ridiculously cheap nowadays, but that's why they, they're keeping up with it by adding things like frame gen, which increases its cost, and then also adding in ray reconstruction, which further increases the cost as well too. So for me, this is just like, okay, 
you can still target similar overall frame times as you do with FSR2 at the moment, and it's potentially getting better. So that's all good news. If it was something like the Switch 2 situation where we're curious to see how they use DLSS given the presumably larger frame time costs on mobile hardware, here this they're saying this costs the same as comp competing techniques on what you're used to already developing for PS5 or Xbox Series X. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I guess we should also talk about um, backwards compatibility or rather the ability to, let me rephrase that, the ability to patch prior PlayStation 5 uh, games to gain access uh, to 5 Pro features. And uh, we do have some information about this from the developer disclosure. And it is quite interesting because if you go back to PlayStation 5 and look at what we called Back Compat Plus, it was quite limited because um, uh, developers right. had to update their old games to the latest SDKs in order to use the PlayStation 5 um, features. Sony has come up with a very interesting solution to this, which is that um, it looks like all games can benefit from PSSR um, if the developer goes back to them, even if they're on older SDKs, um, it looks like developers can go back to those games so they can patch in support for PSSR without having to update the latest SDK. And this is potentially great news, right? I mean, there is a memory footprint implication. It's been cited as being something like 250 megabytes. So developers would need to find that memory on those older um, older titles. Um, but this is a potentially awesome, right? Because a lot of the games that are out there, which are unlikely to f receive full um, upgrades to the latest SDK and all of the new 5 Pro features, it does mean that you can at least get the PSSR upgrade in there if the developer goes back and adds that feature, which I think is excellent because there's been so many games where, the, you know, let's face facts, the resolution has been too low and the upscaling hasn't been good enough to offset that. So the ability to swap in uh, PSSR um, is, is highly compelling, right? I think that's great. Um, but yes, um, there's something else that we need to talk about here, which is that memory allocation. Now, if you're on a newer SDK, it turns out that PlayStation 5 Pro actually has access to much more addressable memory than PlayStation 5. At the moment, PlayStation 5 has, out of its 16 gigs of memory, 12.5 gigabytes of space that's there uh, that the games can use. On the 5 Pro, this increases to, um, I think it's 13.7. It's a 1.2 gigabyte increase in memory that's available to developers, which I think is excellent because that was a big problem with um, 4 Pro. It only had an extra 500 megabytes, but it is still a 16 gigabyte machine. Um, the way this is working, I suspect, is that... Um, Lower, pro, uh, lower priority applications that you know, currently sit within main system memory may move on to some other memory system that's much slower. That's what 4 Pro did effectively. Yeah. But this is excellent news, right? Because um, as Sony says, PSSR has a memory footprint of its own. And they're also suggesting that that extra memory can be used for more complex BVH structures or you know stuff that you need for ray tracing, um, which I think is great, right, Alex? Oh, yeah. I mean, uh, for example, like imagine Spider-Man 2, a uh, uh, good example of ray tracing on console. But like if you looked at the ray traced reflections there, they're limited in their complexity. They're like very simple versus the real world because one, it's expensive to trace that. But two, there's probably also memory considerations as a part of that um, here if you had a PS5 Pro which didn't have unlocked extra memory, it would just be tracing those same kind of low fidelity reflections at higher frame rates or a higher resolution, uh, presuming the CPU doesn't get in the way there for any sense. Um, which is, this is all great because that means they can actually upgrade things meaningfully from a fidelity perspective uh, by having more geometry, more complex geometry in that BBH. I think that's great. Mm -hmm. Anything to add to that, Oliver? Well, I think it shows that Sony is thinking through some of the problems that you'd have if you just bumped up the power and computation of the machine without factoring in that memory subsystem. And yeah. I think that bonus 1.2 gigabytes, you know, if they add two gigabytes of slower DDR 
system memory onto the uh, onto the board there. That would probably do it, given that the PS4 Pro had an extra one gigabyte. And developers got an yeah. extra, I think, half a gig on there. So yeah, that's right. Yeah, mm-hmm. that would that would make sense to me, and that would give them, yeah, enough. I mean, I don't think it would really affect the system too much if you're moving some stuff in the OS, some background applications into that pool of memory. So that yeah. would be a that would certainly be a good way to make the system more usable for, yeah, doing more complex things with the machine beyond just increasing resolution. Although that, of course, carries its own memory footprint hit. So it is it is I think a, a well considered increase it certainly shows that they are thinking through some of these problems and trying to resolve them before they become an issue Mm -hmm. absolutely okay um well let's try and round this off by talking about you know what do we think about all of this generally more holistically now we've discussed all of the individual spec points what do we make of the overall machine and um i'm just going to quickly rifle through what develop what what sony is telling developers about what this machine actually does and now talking about increased resolution increased frame rates um, extra ray tracing features and um, uh, dramatically higher effective resolution via machine learning. Um, and yeah, that's that's kind of about it. There's no major pitch here to developers about beyond that. It is basically an enhanced version of, of the PlayStation 5, in which case I'm not quite sure if it's actually going to expand the market as such. But for those who are possibly thinking about moving to PC, it might make them think twice. We can talk about possible price points as well, because I actually think that similar to PlayStation 4 Pro, this is very much designed um, to be affordable as well, an affordable machine. Um, But ultimately, similar to PlayStation 4 Pro, it is very heavily weighted towards graphical enhancements as opposed to, you know, um, being able to create denser, more richer games owing to that CPU limitation. Uh, Alex, final summary thoughts on this. Oh, wow. Um, summarize <laughs> it. Let me just... Is it the machine that you we, that, that, that you find compelling? I, I, I can answer that with, in a very simple way. If someone came to me and they said, Alex, I have a Ryzen 5 3600 and an RT... RTX 2080, should I buy an RTX 4070? I would say no. I would say you should upgrade other aspects of your CPU, your probably, yeah, definitely your CPU, uh, and then look at a GPU in that point because the entire system's performance will be uplifted in more meaningful ways than just what a GPU could do by its lonesome. And so for me, given how kind of lopsided this is, it does look like, oh, this is a GPU upgrade, and that is it. Um, four years between a GPU upgrade, I guess that's okay on the PC side, but I would probably at that point want a new CPU as well too. So for me, I don't find it a super compelling uh, reason to buy, and I'm curious to see how they market it as, we said 4K the first time, but we actually mean it this time or something like that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> Like, like, I don't know how you advertise it. Um, well, they're also talking about 8K with PSSR as well, which um, I think, what could I say? Um, I had a, a, an 8K TV for four years and I just never used 8K. I didn't find it at all compelling. Um, no. So that doesn't particularly strike me as, uh, as, as a great selling point. And even in um, the developer disclosures, 8K is something that, that's going to happen later. It's not... <laughs> clearly a prime development consideration no, i hope not yeah um, to, uh, to go more? back to, to go back what i was saying so i if i were if i was looking at this in pc terms i would say this is not a great upgrade uh holistically uh one other thing i think that is really interesting is the strategy uh sony apparently here went and rolled their own custom silicon whatever it is to get machine learning performance on the gpu and then rolled their own software on that um it's kind of a weird thing for them to do when they're leveraging AMD. Uh, and AMD, perhaps, it points to either AMD not having these things ready in time or not having them at all. Uh, or maybe these things are going to feed back into later AMD uh, designs uh, because Sony invested in them and they have like this partnership. But I find that just like... Man, only if they were there four years ago with this, or where NVIDIA was at, because it's it's kind of retroactively going back and trying to uh, 
uh, fix the parts where PlayStation 5 is weakest at the moment, other than the CPU. We're saying like, we're not that good at, RDNA 2 is bad at RT. RDNA 2 doesn't have machine learning. So let's do those things for our pro upgrade. Um, I find that just interesting from just like a development perspective over what 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 AMD has been up to. And I'm curious to see what that means for the next Xbox as well too. If this is what Sony's doing, I don't know if Microsoft could leverage that IP uh, for their box. I have no idea how this all works, but uh, I'm excited to see what comes next. But I, I, I'm not super impressed. I just really like that they're going into the machine learning space right now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Oliver? Yeah, I think they are probably trying to capture a certain kind of gamer who's like very, very invested in their ecosystems and in their consoles and who spend a lot of money on games and who might also be interested in the PC. Um, personally, I don't think I'm the majority view on this, certainly from viewing comments online, but I'm very interested in the PS5 Pro. I'm very interested in more advanced console hardware. You know, for me, this is like, hey, you know, another enhanced console. I love the enhanced consoles. They kind of keep, <laughs> they do keep parity to some degree with PC hardware. Um, we saw that last generation where, you know, an Xbox One X, even in 2019, 2020, that was still a, a really high quality GPU, now CPU, different story. Same, same deal here, of course. But the idea of just improving image quality to me is not that exciting. And if that's what the system will primarily be used for, just producing, like, let's say you have your typical PS5 game that might be doing like a 900p or 720p to 1440p upscale in a performance mode. And now you have the wherewithal, the performance and the machine learning hardware and uh, and uh, AI inferencing model to bring that up to 1080p to 4K or 1152p to 4K. That is exciting in some sense, but it's also just like okay, well you gave gave me a clean image. <laughs> I'm still I'm still not uh, quite there maybe in terms of parity to the PC feature set. And that's kind of more what I'm interested in. I'm more, you know, someone who's interested in playing a game like uh, Path Trace Cyberpunk on a console. And if this is not going to be um, all that much more in that direction of travel, then that's not a super exciting system. I'm sure people will leverage it for things like that, but the limited CPU performance could make that an issue. So yeah, I think this is an exciting console for me personally. Um, I do want to see what developers end up doing with it. And I imagine that when Sony comes out that they will have some, I, I have to imagine, pretty compelling showcases of what the hardware can do if they actually do expect people to pick this up this holiday without a huge imperative in terms of the display technology to guide them to a new console. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I've, I'm in two minds about this because I understand exactly where Alex is coming from um, because we are finding the limits of the CPU on the PlayStation 5 and the Xbox uh, Series X. And it's kind of disappointing to see that, you know, when you go to Act 3, Baldur's Gate, um, three, it's uh, clearly an issue. There are other titles coming along where CPU has been proven to be a, a, a bit of an issue. And um, that isn't going to change anything here. You'll get a marginal increase at the expense of basically completely neg negligible impact on GPU performance. So it's kind of like, you know, an extra 10% of CPU is a, is a nice to have, but it's not actually going to change the game in any sort of meaningful way. And um, yeah, so from that perspective, it is a bit of a disappointment, but it's entirely in line with the last time we saw a pro console, right? Um, what I will say, though, is that, what can I say? Extra GPU power, machine learning based upscaling, it's going to solve so many of the issues that we're currently seeing with current gen titles. And maybe those issues aren't really affecting a lot of people at the moment. But, you know, for the people that are disgruntled by it, the PlayStation 5 Pro is going to fix all of that. And I think that's pretty, pretty special. I also really like the idea of a machine learning block being a part of a console um, because, you know, it's the direction of travel. Right? AI is going to be so important going into the next generation. So the idea that developers have access to that hardware right here, right now, and are able to start experimenting with it. I think it's just going to be great for games across the board. And we might actually see more than just um, upscaling using that particular hardware. I mean, 300 tops is pretty, <laughs> pretty fast. potent piece of uh, machine learning silicon that's uh, incorporated into the GPU there. I guess that's the other thing, of course, is that it does seem to be entirely 
uh, integrated into the GPU. It's not an NPU, as we're seeing in some of the other AMD silicon at the moment. So I think that's a conscious decision from Sony, and it does kind of mirror the design decisions taken by NVIDIA and uh, Intel in the past. Yeah. It's the right way to go, I think. So, yeah, yeah very interested to see what they're going to be doing with this. Um, but it is interesting that, you know, in terms of the possible game enhancements that Sony itself is describing to developers, it's, it is basically, you know, not a game changer. But I actually think once you go hands on and see the games and see what this machine learning upscaling can do, compare it to what the PlayStation 5 is doing, and it's it should be a lot, lot better. <laughs> um, final discussion point, Oliver. Um, do you think Microsoft are going to respond to this? I don't think they can because, you know, basically Phil Spencer has already ruled out a pro console. But at the same time, there has been talk of um, exciting announcements coming in the holiday season. So where do you think this sits? I actually think that's a really good question, because if you look back to the FTC leak from Microsoft back, I think, last September, you had them sketch out a console that's actually, you know, look at that in broad strokes. That is pretty darn similar to what Sony is delivering four years into this generation in terms of what they're trying to do with machine learning, in terms of the areas of ideation, what they want to do with that machine learning hardware, when they want to do um, lots of stuff with, uh, with enhanced ray tracing, all this other stuff in there. It does sound a little bit like this console, and obviously, you know, Microsoft has a bit bigger vision for it potentially than what Sony is outlining in this document. But it certainly does seem a lot like that console. And I kind of think that as time goes on and as we see more software uh, mooted for this machine, that that actually might become a more interesting uh, console. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it does put Microsoft in a bit of a difficult position right now because I don't think they will have a pro console. I think they're likely to announce a handheld, which is an entirely different proposition and exciting in its own right. But um, yeah, I mean, the concept of having three different Xbox series machines, uh, it, it just doesn't really make sense. Um, doubling down on Xbox series when they're having so many issues selling hardware, I, I, I don't think it's gonna shift the needle that much. And actually, when you think about it, Xbox One X, despite being an absolutely fantastic console, um, the best of its generation didn't really shift the needle in terms of PlayStation dominance there either. Um, I think they're just going to double down on next gen. Maybe they'll bring forward next gen. I mean, there's been talk of 2026, which would be ambitious, I'd say, if, uh, when they're talking about the biggest generational leap ever. Mm -hmm. um, but it does sort of, you know, mean that right now, at least at the top end side of things that, you know, PlayStation 5 Pro will be in a class of its own unless, you know, there has been a radical shift behind the scenes and Phil Spencer has changed his mind effectively. Um, let's talk pricing. Alex, what do you think? 100 more on top of whatever the current is, maybe? Yeah. I think that sounds right. Uh, that puts it, I mean, it depends on your territory, but that it's, it's a expensive console at that point. Yeah. Oliver? I think 600 USD or $100 more, the, the equivalent in your local currency, but with uh, no disk drive, but with a detachable uh, disk drive That's support. I, so. I would Good be point. quite upset if your pro console was launched with features that the base one, <laughs> uh, without features that the base one has. I mean, there is a report from Tom Henderson, whose sourcing so far has been impeccable, that says that it is compatible with the existing detachable drive, or or at the very least that it has a detachable drive. So there is going to be some component in there. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> so whether they actually launch it without yeah, one, that's going to be quite Looking at that detachable drive. Well, I'm just looking at this thing and thinking about how the aesthetics of that would go, presuming that it is the same detachable drive model. Oh, no. so like you got this yeah, kind of like ugly protrusion here. <laughs> Maybe if they made it more bold. angular. Yeah, I don't know. I'm not a huge fan of that personally. <laughs> no. Um, yeah, uh, from my personal perspective, I think there'll probably be a soft price cut on PlayStation 5 because, you know, it's been selling below RRP or MSRP rather for a long time in specific marketing periods. 
so it may well be the case that there will be more than a one hundred dollar price differential oh. in real terms, but in MSRP terms, it probably will be an extra one hundred dollars. And when you look at the design of the machine, uh, I doubt the memory is actually uh, the faster memory is actually going to be an increased cost configure uh, consideration. There'll be uh, possibly some extra memory to accommodate the extra, you know, moving non-essential stuff from system memory onto to DDR, as, as, as was the case with PlayStation 4 Pro, to free up that extra memory for titles. And But I think the main expense is going to be the much larger chip, right? That just makes sense. You know, you go from 36 to 60 CUs. Um, beyond that, I guess it would be just the cooling assembly, right? That would be more expensive. More expensive. Yeah. Yeah. Unless there's something we just don't know yet about this machine, but that does seem likely. Um, I think that's really all I've got to say about the PlayStation 5 Pro at the moment. But, you know, we're in the situation where we're recording this before GDC. If historical precedent means anything, there's a good chance we'll get some sort of disclosure from Sony during the event. Maybe even today, <laughs> which means we've oh just my. filmed a lot of this for nothing. No! Um, and um, but yeah I suspect there's going to be more developer documentation leaks before too long because there is a lot of stuff on there um, any final words or can we just wrap this one up I got Alex? one last thing why is Sony eating Microsoft's lunch man they came to the table with machine learning upscaling <laughs> before the Xbox Series X did and they advertised that for the Xbox Series X like man they're just eating Microsoft's yeah. lunch They said it was an day. area of active uh, active research the last time right. I spoke to Microsoft about it. Sure. And the, the yeah. Series X actually has pretty respectable machine learning performance. I think it's like 47 tops int 8 or 48 tops int 8. So it yeah. is like it's it's a lot slower than what Sony is moving in this document. But it probably is fast enough for something judging from the pc side with xcss right it's like it's fast vicinity. enough for something that's for certain <laughs> they've for never something. done it <laughs> <laughs> there's actually something maybe we can quickly clarify here is because some people seem to believe that xbox series consoles do have uh, dedicated machine learning silicon and and they do to a certain extent but it's not the same as what ps5 pro is doing right alex I mean, well, I, I would still just like to say we, they still haven't shown like a diagram of what this GPU looks like. So I don't want to 100 percent say it's exactly the same thing. But yeah. I'll just say like them just making it so that the GPU can run certain instructions at double the rate uh, is still using the entire GPU to do that entire process on the Series yes. X versus what nvidia and intel do and i'm hoping sony did here where there's a dedicated different part of the gpu and mo many of them not like an mpu that's separate but like in each cu there's like another unit or adjacent unit that just does these type of maths and that's all it does and that would be a tensor core or the xmx units in um intel and that's different and there's a reason why it's better uh that's why people are moving to it that's why apple's doing it right so yeah i mean if we're talking about a two millisecond computational cost it it kind of rules out anything else really doesn't it I, depending I, on what pssr actually is of course yeah i mean i i i we don't know how small or big the model is or are these things but i would assume it i would hope it's pointing to the fact that we actually have this as a dedicated unit on the gpu and that's why mm -hmm. it is two milliseconds okay uh, I think that's all we've really got to say about this one. So obviously new details are emerging practically daily at this point. So maybe we'll update at some point or maybe we'll discuss it further in the next TF Direct Weekly. But that's all we've got to say about this one for now. So if you did enjoy the content, please do like, subscribe, share, ring the bell for whatever no notifications may or may not appear and uh, store.digitalfoundry.net for a selection of our merchandising wares. Um, but that's all from us on this one. We'll see you soon.